please welcome Ron Kirkwood. Thank you. Thanks for having me. When George Meade was bombed out of the Lydia Leister House by Confederate overshots on July 3rd, he retreated to the top of Powers Hill to watch the rest of the battle that day. Now, when he arrived at Powers Hill, he was then on the farms of George Spangler and Nathaniel Leitner. George owned two-thirds of the farm, and Nathaniel Leitner owned another third, the other third of the farm. As you know, he went back to the battlefield for a while after watching it from up there, but later that evening, he returned to Powers Hill. Only this time, he returned to the base of the hill, strictly or mainly on Spangler land, and he set up his Leicester, where he was at first was around here, and that night he set up his headquarters right down here along the Baltimore Pike. Now, there's no marker there. There should be, but there's no marker there. But the trees, there's still woods here, and it's right by where the General Slocum headquarters marker is if you want to visit it. That was Meade's headquarters on the night of the 3rd and the morning of the 4th. Cincinnati Gazette, uh, Reporter Whitelaw Reed was there when Meade arrived at Powers Hill on Spangler land on the night of the 3rd. He wrote, General Meade rode up, calm as ever, and called for paper and aids. He had orders already to issue. A band came marching in over the hillside. On the evening air, its notes floated out. Significant melody hailed to the chief. Reed was also there on the morning of the 4th with Meade, and he recorded this. The general had a little wall tent in which he was dictating orders and receiving dispatches. General Ingalls, the chief quartermaster, had his writing table in the open end of a covered wagon. The rest, majors, colonels, generals, and all, had slept on the ground and were now standing around the campfires. It was dry early in the morning, but then, as you all know, the famous thunderstorms hit July 4th at Gettysburg, and that is the only reason Meade left uh, Spangler land. Here's uh, his chief of staff, Dan Butterfield, said, we were almost drowned out of headquarters down in the woods. So Meade and his staff picked up again, and they moved uh, inside somewhere on the Baltimore Pike. That's, I don't know exactly where that was, and historians there don't know exactly where he moved. It could have been along the Rock Creek, that a house there where General Neal's headquarters. It could have been up along across the street from where the Pike restaurant is, up closer to the cemetery. That hasn't been nailed down yet. General Meade's army had depended on the George Spangler farm military and medically since July 1st, to the point that I argue in my book that it was the most important farm in the Battle of Gettysburg. So I think it's perfect that Meade used this farm July 3rd and 4th to close the military part of the battle. So we will start here tonight with the farm's logistical significance, and I will also discuss how their Philadelphia area area and southern New Jersey men and women who played key roles on the George Spangler farm. We will look at the Spanglers and we will look at the two hospitals on Spangler property. This is the line on July 2nd, 3rd, 1863. This is the George Spangler farm. This is a huge farm. It's 166 acres. It's big and it's right, it dominates the countryside and it's right behind the line. It's close, it's close to the left flank, it's close to the center, and it's close to the right flank. Commanders could put infantry and artillery reserves right here, which they did, and they used this farm often like that. Then there are the roads. You've got Granite Schoolhouse Lane cutting right here through the farm. You've got Blacksmith Shop Road cutting down through here, through the farm, connecting the Tawny Town Road and the Baltimore Pike, the main arteries. This was a farm with the roads and the proximity and the size that could help win a battle, and that's how it was used. This is a close-up of the George Spangler farm. Um, 
Any follower of, Get follower of Gettysburg has heard of the 20th Maine, Josh Lawrence Chamberlain, and the other regiments that came in and defended Little Round Top. What they do not know usually is that most of those fifth corps regiments, including Chamberlain and the 20th Maine, rested most of the day right here on Spangler Farm and right off Spangler Farm on Musser and Boucher land down to Rock Creek. So the fifth corps was there till about five o'clock and then they rushed down Granite Schoolhouse Lane to the left here through the farm and headed to Little Round Top. Other men of the fifth corps went down Blacksmith Shop Road. Right after these guys left at about five, 5.30, the 6th Corps moved in here after their overnight 30-mile march. They, too, were on Spangler and, Mus the Spangler and Musser Farms, but they didn't stay there long. They, too, headed out, and they, too, headed out to the battlefield. Later on that night, elements of the 12th Corps on Culp's Hill were called, and they cut through to the front lines. Right here was the 4th New Jersey Infantry from Trenton. They had several companies here. They were to guard the ammunition train right here. And they were also working uh, provost guard duty. So when, during the cannonade prior to Pickett's charge and all these guys, are, hundreds of guys are escaping down this road, the 4th New Jersey went out and stopped them. And I have a quote on that. Fugitives from the field began to rush toward the rear upon the road upon which I was stationed, said Major General Char Charles Ewing of the 4th New Jersey. I immediately deployed across the road and into the woods on my right flank with fixed bayonets, where I stopped and reorganized between 400 and 500 men, whom I turned over to Provost Marshal General Marcina Patrick. As soon as the panic subsided, I resumed my former duty with the ammunition train, which was not again interrupted during the battle. The ammunition train arrived in the morning of July 2nd. That's 100 wagons. There's uh, hundreds of men, hundreds of horses and mules. They're supplying all of the artillery ammunition for the entire Army of the Potomac. They arrived on the morning of the 2nd with 27,000 artillery rounds. Guys, batteries came all night long, all day long to restock, and by the, by the time they left Spangler on July 3rd, they were down to 4,000 rounds. Uh, ambulances were here for the 11th Corps. They were over here as well. They were on East Cemetery Hill. They were all over the place. The big hospital was the 11th Corps Hospital around the Spangler's barn and house. I'll get into that in detail. This is artillery reserve. I'll get into that in great detail. There were more cavalry and infantry bivouacs around here. This is Granite Schoolhouse. This is an important one to remember. This was the second hospital on Spangler property. Okay, uh, artillery reserve here, infantry here. Here again, I have Meade's headquarters marked and where it was right on the pike on Spangler land. General Slocum used the, the top of the hill and the bottom of the hill on Leitner and Spangler from July 1st through the 5th. The whole time he was in Gettysburg, Slocum was on Spangler and Leitner property. This is one um, artillery battery. That's all the men, all the horses, all the cannons in one battery. Well, there were 19 of these batteries, artillery reserve batteries on Spangler's farm, so you can imagine how much room it took up. It took up a lot. Uh, again, the artillery reserve arrived starting on the morning of the 2nd, and they finished arriving early afternoon on the 2nd. Every one of the seven infantry corps in the Army of the Potomac had their own cannons, but these guys went wherever the corps went. They were assigned, they had no choice, and they had about 200 cannons between them. Then you bring in, an, in the artillery reserve. They had 106 cannons, 2,300 men, 2,300 horses. That's another whole third of power, but the best thing is they're not tied to anybody. They can go wherever they're needed, and that's why this location was so critical. All through the second and the third, where the artillery res were what reserve was, there were holes that needed to be plugged all over on the line. Um, they fought along the Wheatfield Road. They were out at the Peach Orchard. They were at the Trostle House. They were along the Plum Run, Plum Run Line. They were along Cemetery Ridge. They, were around, they fought at Kadori. They fought on Cemetery Hill, and they fought on East Cemetery Hill. 
And they were even on Powers Hill on the Spangler's land. Have most of you seen that photo of the horses at the Trosso house where the, the field is just covered in dead horses? It's a famous, horrible photo. Those horses were from the 9th Massachusetts Battery. The 9th Massachusetts was in the artillery reserve, so those horses were at Spangler minutes before all that happened. The 9th Massachusetts rushed out from Spangler. They fought along the Wheatfield Road. They got pushed back to Trosso, and that's where most of their horses died. Other farms saw a lot more combat than the George Spangler farm at Gettysburg. Other farms were literally destroyed by some of the worst fighting ever seen in this nation. But no single farm played a greater strategic and logistical role with its two roads, with Powers Hill, than in its middle of the all location for both the artillery and infantry than the George Spangler farm in setting up the Army of the Potomac to victory. Granite Schoolhouse Hospital. The first division caught the heaviest of the blow. Many killed and wounded were the result, and the latter were now being brought to the hospital in great numbers. The Granite Schoolhouse Hospital surgeon in charge, Dr. William Warren Potter, 57th New York. Granite Schoolhouse was built in the early 1860s when the Spanglers donated the land in the heart of their farm for it. On days two and three of the battle, there was a major First Division, Second Corps, Army of the Potomac Hospital in the fields and woods around the school on the Spangler's farm. This hospital has received little attention and little has been revealed about it until now. There's not even a sign for it. This is what it looks like now. This is where the school was. This tree accidentally marks the spot. So I would bet, bet that 90 to 95% of the residents of Adams County drive by there and they have no idea that there was an important hospital. Like the Meade headquarters needs a sign, this place needs a sign. And I wrote that, I wrote that in the book. This hospital, like I said, hosted the first division of the second corps. These were the guys who fought at the wheat field that's how important they were. Everybody's heard of the wheat field, but where did they go after? After they fought at the wheat field, they went to the George Spangler farm to the Granite Schoolhouse. These were the fighters of the Fighting Irish Brigade. These were the guys who uh, Father Corby is honored for on the battlefield for uh, granting them general absolution, creating their path to heaven moments before they were going into battle to be slaughtered. This is the Corps of uh, General Hancock. This division lost over 1,000 casualties in one day of fighting. And most of them on July 2nd were either on their way to the George Spangler farm to this hospital or they were waiting to be taken there. Chaplain John Henry Wilbrand stuck in Burg of Erie in the 145th Pennsylvania served at the Granite Schoolhouse. He said, our hospital was at the foot of Powers Hill. I found the doctors and nurses busily engaged with the wounded, scattered around in all directions, some lying on blankets, some on straw, a few on stretchers, others on the bare ground. Private Erastus Allen of Company G shot through the abdomen, suffered terribly. Some of the intestines protruded through the wound and some of their contents would occasionally flow out, producing a horrible stench. It was very evident that our regiment had again suffered severely. Second Corps Ambulance Chief Lieutenant Thomas Livermore made numerous deliveries to Granite Schoolhouse on July 2nd. Here under the shelter of some boulders lay a large number of our wounded and dead who had been brought from the field. They lay upon the ground covered with their blankets and the living were nearly all silent, having fallen asleep from fatigue those boulders that uh, Lieutenant Livermore mentioned are still there. Also still there underneath Powers Hill is a stream that Dr. Potter noted when he said the hospital's location was near a stream protected by a ridge from great danger of shells. Brigadier General Samuel K. Zook was wounded on Wheatfield, what is now Wheatfield Road. He had such a horrible wound in his chest 
was such a big hole in his chest that at Granite Schoolhouse, the doctor could see his heart beating. Um, he was taken away farther behind the lines and he died the next day at another house. <coughs> um, this marker to him is on the north end of the wheat field along Wheatfield Road. <coughs> Colonel Cross was wounded, mortally wounded, on the other side of the wheat field. Cross Avenue is named, named for him, and he died that night at Granite Schoolhouse. Um, he was beloved by many of his fighters, um, but he had temper issues and drinking issues, and uh, he wasn't beloved by everybody. In fact, his, his unit's Pioneer Corps called him a tyrant, and they refused to bury him in Gettysburg. Lieutenant George A. Woodruff of the 1st United States Art Artillery Battery I was mortally wounded on July 3rd during Pickett's Charge when he was hit in the back while facing and directing his men at Ziegler's Grove. The son of a Michigan judge died at Granite Schoolhouse telling his friends that he regretted being shot in the back and asking, asking that, it should not be, that it should be no reflection upon his reputation. Most of the 1st Division 2nd Corps Hospital at the Granite Schoolhouse was moved to safety farther behind the line on day third after 24 hours of intense service because it was getting hit by Confederate artillery overshots from Culp's Hill to the east and the Pickett's Charge cannonade to the west. In fact, every major Union hospital directly behind the line was moved farther away during the battle except the 11th Corps Hospital in the Spangler's Building, even though it was under fire too. Philadelphia boy General Hancock even stopped at this hospital in his ambulance after being wounded during Pickett's Charge, probably to issue more communications. But he didn't stick around in Gettysburg long. He was in a Philadelphia hospital on July 4th. Like I said earlier, like Meade Spangler headquarters, this Spangler hospital and school need a marker and recognition. Today is, is just unmarked woods. Most drive by, who drive by, have no idea what happened there. One day cured me of a hospital. Give me the picket line every time in place of a hospital. Captain Matthew B. Cheney, 154th New York, after visiting the 11th Corps Hospital at the Spangler's Farm. The 11th Corps medical staffers picked the Spangler's Farm for a hospital on July 1st because of its proximity to the evolving front line and access to water, crops, and livestock for food, buildings for hospital purposes, good roads, and wood for operating tables, fires, tents, and caskets. While the 1st Division 2nd Corps Hospital used the school on Spangler land, the 11th Corps Hospital used the Spangler's barn, summer kitchen, house, other outbuildings, and fields. The United States Christian and Sanitary Commissions estimated that, that there were about 1,900 wounded at this hospital at its peak on July 4th and 5th. There were between 50 and 100 Confederates among those 1,900. The Christian Commission, by the way, was established in Philadelphia in 1861 and had an encampment at Spangler where volunteers handed out donated food, clothing, and hospital goods and ministered to the wounded and dying. Wounded started to arrive at this hospital at about 4 p.m. on July 1st with the fighting north of town and in town. Dr. Daniel G. Brinton of Westchester, of his time at Spangler. The wounded soon began to pour in, giving us such sufficient occupation that from the 1st of July till the afternoon of the 5th, I was not absent from the hospital more than once, and then but for an hour or two. Very hard work it was too, and little sleep fell to our share. Four operating tables were going night and day. Many of them were hurt in the most shocking manner by shells. My experience at Chancellorsville was nothing compared to this, and I never wished to see such another sight. For myself, I think I never was more exhausted. Dr. Britton became a professor at Penn and a noted anthropologist after the war, especially concerning the American Indian, writing more than 20 books. He said of leaving Spangler on July 5th, I confess it was with a feeling of intense relief that my got, I got my orders to leave this place where groans and cries had been resounding in my ears for days. That's underneath the fore bay of the Spangler barn at the front. <coughs> Surgeries and amputations took place right there under the fore bay. 
There, doctors could have more light and fresh air away from the smells and the crowds inside the barn. It was also safer for anesthesia use at night with lanterns burning. Four surgeons worked under the forebay with their backs to the wall. A surgeon would finish one amputation or operation in five to 15 minutes and then move immediately to the next one. No washing required of bloody or germ-infested hands or bloody equipment because they didn't understand how proper sanitation could prevent infection and reduce the spread of disease. Sometimes a Spangler surgeon with germ-covered germ -covered hands would put his fingers in a, a relatively healthy patient and inflict him with that disease. A Spangler surgeon who was approaching total exhaustion called the work too much for human endurance. Private William Sellerson, age 19 of the 75th Ohio, said, at the doorway, I saw a huge stack of amputated arms and legs, a stack as high as my head. The most horrible thing I ever saw in my life. I wish I had never seen it. I sickened. Amputated limbs were loaded into a wagon when they got about head high and taken away in somewhere far, a far field and buried. The Spanglers undoubtedly knew where these limbs were buried, but unfortunately we don't. We don't know today. The amputations and surgeries and wounds attracted an infestation of flies that relentlessly harassed everyone. Pigeons in the barn added to the filth and hornets added to the pain. Then there were the maggots that covered wounds and eating infected and dead tissue. Blood is known to have dripped from the wounded on the top floor of the barn between the floorboards and onto the wounded on the bottom floor. I was talking about this with a couple of you earlier. This is the classic Pennsylvania bank barn. If you drive around the Gettysburg battlefield, they are everywhere. They were brought over by the Germans and the Swiss in the 1700s and 1800s. In Pennsylvania, they're big in south central Pennsylvania where Gettysburg is, they're big farther north. In central Pennsylvania, they're big farther west uh, and along eastern Pennsylvania a bit too, you'll see the Pennsylvania bank barn. Two main features. Uh, the four bay in the front that hangs over seven feet, that gives them more storage space upstairs. And then either on the side or in the back of the barn, there's a bank that goes up to the top floor. And the farmer can drive his wagon right up to the top floor and for easy loading and unloading. I think this is a brilliant design. And when I drive through my home state of Michigan and I see other type barns, they just don't make as much sense to me. <laughs> this is a nicely designed barn. The other thing I was talking about earlier is the front of them usually face south, southeast, east, because it warms the, the barnyard, it warms the animals, and at the same time, the back wall of the barn blocks the westerly wind and that helps warm them as well. Dr. Britton, the Westchester guy, said there were 500 men in this barn at its peak. Men were crammed so closely together that it caused the spread of diseases. Some men died of these diseases rather than the battle wound that brought them to the hospital. The cries of agony of the wounded and dying forced the hospital staff to cover their ears in order to sleep. Two female nurses played key roles at Spangler. Marilla Hovey and her 17-year-old son Frank traveled with her husband, Dr. Bleeker Lansing Hovey of the 136th New York and she was always one of the first ones to reach the hospital during a battle. Unfortunately, we have no photos of Mrs. Hovey today, but we're still looking. The Hoveys are the only surgeon's family known to have traveled together during the Civil War. Mrs. Hovey nursed the wounded and rode home to family members of the dead and dying. She looked past their terrible wounds and their blood and their vomit and held the hands of dying soldiers and talked to them of their family and her own life in a desperate attempt to get their mind off their agony and their situation. In one letter from Spangler, Mrs. Hovey informed a family of their son's death and told them, I have had a good deal of care of him and called him my soldier boy and tried to take the place of mother, sister, and friend. I think I never had such a trial parting with one that I had no more acquaintance with. The Hoveys worked at the 11th Corps Hospital for the entire five weeks it was open and then went home for a three week break in New York to recover. Nurse Rebecca Lane Pennypacker Price is of Phoenixville, Chester County. She rode to Gettysburg in the middle of the night on a bench in a railroad car. 
and she had dona donations from Phoenixville. She arrived shortly after the battle. She said, the sad scenes would fill a volume. So many times at night, I lay on my stretcher weeping instead of sleeping. Nurse Price worked almost five weeks at the hospital. She said the Confederate wounded received equal medical treatment, but she admitted to sometimes giving the Confederates the smallest oranges and apples. <laughs> That's the Spangles House, summer kitchen, smoke house. You can see the barn off to the left in the background, and you can even see the bank off to the left. I've confirmed and listed the names, wound, and treatment of 1,435 Union and Confederate men at the Spangler 11th Corps Hospital, and the names of almost 140 men who were buried in the Spangler's peach and apple orchards right out here. And I have them in the book. The Union dead at Spangler were exhumed later that year and they were all reburied in Soldiers National Cemetery in Gettysburg. The Confederate men lay in all over Gettysburg until 1872 when they were finally dug up and reburied in four cemeteries in the South. Armistead is one of the five known Confederates to have been buried at Spangler. The arrival of this important general at the 11th Corps Hospital during the evening of July 3rd, after his mortal wounding and heroic leadership crossing the wall with his hat on his sword during Pickett's charge caused such a stir that his ambulance wagon was surrounded by a crowd of gawkers. Eventually it was broken up by a surgeon so Armistead could be treated. Armistead jo died July 5th in the Spangler's summer kitchen. Right there. He was buried at Spangler only to be exhumed a month later by an embalmer from Philadelphia who wanted to make some money off of his body. So he had him dug up. He uh, embalmed whatever he could, whatever was left of his body, and he reburied him in the Spangler Orchard. And then in uh, October, Armistead's family claimed him and um, paid whatever money the embalmer was asking for. And Armistead was put on a train, and uh, he's reburied in downtown Baltimore right now. These are examples of the wounded lists in my <coughs> book. There's some 75th Pennsylvania guys in there. They're from Philly. 27th Pennsylvania examples in here too. This is what the Spangler House looked like in 1863. The Colonel Mahler here. He was from the all German 75th Pennsylvania from Philly. He died shortly after the battle in the Spangler's house. Many of the 75th wounded on the July 1st day one fight were taken prisoner because of the rapid advance of the Confederates. But Mahler was rescued immediately and taken to the 11th Corps Hospital. The Philadelphia City Council honored him later in July with a resolution and paid for his funeral. Mahler's brother, 2nd Lieutenant Lewis, was killed during that same fighting on July 1st. 26 wounded men from the 75th Pennsylvania are known to have been treated at the 11th Corps Hospital at Spangler and are listed in my book, including their wound and treatment. There were undoubtedly more, and even though government records in DC are incomplete, starting next month, I'm gonna make many trips down there because I think I can get more names. Most of the 75th Pennsylvania men who were wounded on July 1st weren't picked up by ambulances and taken to Spangler until July 4th or 5th because they were trapped behind Confederate lines until the Confederates retreated. That men of the 70, meant the men of the 75th had another problem in addition to their struggle to survive when they finally arrived at Spangler. All of the farm's buildings were full and not enough tents or bedding were provided by the army. They weren't ready for a battle like this. So all of these guys were forced to lie outside in, on the bare ground and in the mud, especially when the July 4th thunderstorms hit. Colonel William R. Kiefer, a hospital steward from the 153rd Pennsylvania said, Hundreds were lying with but feeble or in most cases with no shelter, exposed to a cold incessant rain against the sides of the barn and in an orchard adjoining the sheds. Their moans were heard in every direction. And with a lantern, I moved about from one to another during the long hours of the night. I searched in vain for blankets to cover the suffering and dying. The 75th involvement, involvement at Spangler extended to the medical side where 28-year-old surgeon in charge James A. Armstrong 
of the 75th ran the hospital for most of the five plus weeks that it was in business. Dr. Armstrong was in charge of everything from monitoring the surgeons to approving when a patient could be released to getting supplies to overseeing the burial of the dead. Armstrong graduated from the Philadelphia College of Pharmacy and the University of Pennsylvania Medical School before the war. And a chaplain who was at Spangler wrote in the July 14, 1863 Philadelphia Inquirer that Dr. Armstrong is the most able and efficient medical officer who is working nobly for the welfare and comfort of the wounded. The doctor has charge of the 11th Corps Hospital and I find the wounded more comfortable here than at any other place. Dr. Armstrong died of a stroke at age 50 in Camden. Though Armstrong didn't, many surgeons in the 11th Corps, including some at Spangler, suffered at, suffered, studied at Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia. And many of the wounded that Armstrong deemed well enough to transfer to bigger general hospitals went to the gigantic 4,500 bed Satterley General Hospital in Philadelphia, which is gone now, but at the time was located over by Penn the all-German 27th Pennsylvania from Philadelphia had the same problems as the 75th. First, it was overrun by superior Confederate numbers on day one, only instead of north of town like the 75th, it was the brickyard closer to town. Secondly, many of the wounded of the 27th also were trapped behind the quickly advancing Confederate line and were prisoners of war until 11th Corps ambulances could reach them after the battle. And thirdly, like the 75th, there was no protected room for them once they finally arrived at Spangler, and they too had to lie in the open in the weather. The men of the 27th and 75th who were wounded on Cemetery Hill on July 2nd and 3rd got to Spangler quickly because they were behind the Army of the Potomac Line, and many 11th Corps ambulances were stationed there for the short drive to the hospital. A couple of dozen men from the 27th PA are list listed in my book with their wounds and treatment at Spangler. Assistant Surgeon William H. H. Ginkinger of the 27th is known to have worked at the 11th Corps Hospital for most or all of July. The 73rd also was a predominantly Philadelphia regiment at Spangler, and it was only a little less German than the 27th and 75th. It had more than a dozen men on the Spangler wounded list and two dead. The 73rd rushed to the line on East Cemetery Hill on the night of July 2nd to help push back a Confederate breakthrough. Private George Nixon III uh, went to war uh, at age 40 with a wife and nine kids at home because he was a poor farmer renting a farm. He just entered the army to support his family. He died at Spangler and he would become the great grandfather of President Richard Nixon. Adjutant and First Lieutenant Joseph Haney age 21 of the 157th New York, died of a leg wound at Spangler. Nurse Price of Phoenixville walked next to his stretcher and held an umbrella over him to protect him from the July sun as he was taken to the Spangler barn for an amputation. First Lieutenant Thomas Wheeler, 75th Ohio, age 25, spent almost a month at Spangler before he died of wounds in his right side, right leg, left groin, and left arm. His parents were at his side and Nurse Price sang Rock of Ages to him as he died. One soldier died at Spangler one day before his grief-stricken father reached him. Another died a few days before his wife reached Spangler. Both family members found out, found out about their loved one's death when they arrived. Many died at the 11th Corps Hospital who were the lone source of income for their sickly parents back home. Happily, the vast majority of the 11th Corps patients survived. Captain Alfred E. Lee of the 82nd Ohio was treated at Spangler for a hip wound. He, when he got home to Ohio, he found his obituary in the newspaper, and then he walked in on his funeral. <laughs> <laughs> Captain Frederick Stowe, 23 years old, hit in the head by a Confederate shell fragment on Cemetery Hill. Stowe was the son of Harriet Beecher Stowe, famous abolitionist author, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Everybody in 1863 probably pretty much knew who she was. So he was a celebrity and he was put in the summer kitchen and he survived. General Francis Barlow had three wounds at, at the three wounds at three doctors all declared to be mortal, but he lived. 
Corporal James Brown, we of the 134th New York, survived seven gunshot wounds at the brickyard on July 1st, one of which broke four ribs. He also was shot three times through the bowels and in the left thigh, right thigh, and lower back, and he was hit in his knapsack by a piece of railroad iron fired by a Confederate cannon. <laughs> he lived. <laughs> if you combine the number of wounded treated at the two Spangler hospitals, the, one, the, the 11th Corps Hospital, and then the Grant Schoolhouse Hospital in the middle of their farm, and they had about 2,500 to 3,000 men, wounded men on their farm. The population of Gettysburg at that time was 2,400, so they had more guys on their farm than Gettysburg had in the borough. The Spanglers. The 11th Corps wounded continued to be sent away until finally on August 7th, the Spanglers had their farm back after five weeks and two days, at least what was left of it. Typical of many farms in the Gettysburg area, the Spanglers' barn and house and other buildings were essentially destroyed, as were their crops and hand-built walls and fences. Their horses, cows, sheep, and pigs, all of their food was taken. Their home was filled with nauseous smells, blood, and other body fluids. The Spanglers filed three damage claims totaling about $5,000 to the state and federal governments, but they received only a total of $90 for six tons of hay. In denying their claims, the U.S. Quartermaster's agent said, the government of the United States is no more responsible for bringing on the battle fought there than it would have been had a tornado passed over that country, causing as widespread destruction as did that terrible engagement. That battle and hospital damage was his misfortune. By the way, those beams that are holding up the four bay, they weren't there in 1863. The foundation had to add those because it was drooping so far. <coughs> okay, George and Elizabeth, the original owners of the farm, they moved away actually next door to a smaller farm in the 1870s. Farming the land then where they was after <coughs> them was their youngest son, Benaiah, right there his wife Sarah, and their daughter Mary Elizabeth. I think this, this photo was taken by William Tipton and I think it was taken on the 25th anniversary of the battle in 1888. <coughs> and you can see, you can see how well the Spanglers recovered. Because their house, everything left of the porch was not there in 1863. They actually added on after their kids grew up and moved away. The smoke house where they smoked their meats, cured their meats, preserved them outhouse, the summer kitchen, which has a grape arbor on it. Not only did they grow grapes on it, but they used it for shade to get their work done. So I think the Gettysburg Foundation needs to uh, put a grape arbor up. They don't have one right now. The summer kitchen where Armistead and Stowe were, and this is a beehive oven for baking bread. They would <coughs> stick the bread from the inside of the kitchen into the oven. And then there's other buildings there that they had, chickens, etc hay, wood, and the barn. And the foundation right now is in the process of building a, a picket fence to put up there so it looks like it did back then. Now, these are the only, these are the only two known photos of Spangler descendants. So you've got this one with Benaya and his granddaughter Mary Elizabeth. Okay, now, this is a schoolhouse in the mid 1850s. Benaya was a member of the school board, so he's in the photo. This is Benaya looking like he just walked off the set of Fiddler on the Roof right here. <laughs> um, here's his daughter again, Mary Elizabeth. Now, Benaya's sister was, one of his two sisters was Sabina, and she married a Patterson who lived next door. The, she married the boy next door. This is George's granddaughter, Clara another granddaughter, Alice. And who do you think this person is holding the ruler right here? T teacher. <laughs> Teacher's holding the ruler. This is little Raphael Sherpy. His family owned a peach orchard and this is Raphael's dog. Sadly, Raphael's dad has already died by this point. I'm not sure why. I don't have a lot on that. And these are just close-ups of Benaya and Mary Elizabeth taken from that photo. 
George was 47 years old and Elizabeth was 44 during the Battle of Gettysburg. Their children, all of whom were living at home, were 21-year-old Harriet, 19-year-old Sabina, 17-year-old Daniel, and 14-year-old Beniah. The six Spanglers were ordered to stay together in one upstairs bedroom while their home was a hospital. They could leave the room, but in doing so, they had to step over and around wounded and dying men and blood and other body filth just to get out of their house. Spangler neighbor Nathaniel Leitner's house also was used for a hospital. He tried to live in the house after the battle, but couldn't because the smells and filth made his wife ill. Even after he remodeled it, it remained. George Spangler was chairman of the Cumberland Township School Board when he donated the land for the Granite Schoolhouse to be built on his property in 1861. He also was a church and Adams County leader, serving on several boards. Both he and Elizabeth died at age 88. A teacher whom George hired said, Mr. Spangler proved himself to be a very efficient school official and made a lasting impression on my mind as a man of truthfulness and honesty in all things. And I, I live to see my belief demonstrated time and again. If any of you know where this is, Elizabeth died at what is now Mr. G's Ice Cream on Baltimore Street. Anybody know where that Mr. G's Ice Cream is? <laughs> Few of us. <laughs> she was living there with Beniah and his family after George's death. Elizabeth took care of her widower father in his later years and made sure he was buried next to her and George. The Spanglers also took in a niece after George's sister, Susanna, died. All four Spangler children became productive adults. Harriet and Sabina married local farmers and had families. Daniel moved to Kansas to use his carpentry skills in the growing new state and settled near Abilene around the time that Wild Bill Hickok served as marshal there in the early 1870s. Benaya worked the family farm for many years until he gave up farming and moved into town. As was common in families these di those days, personal tragedy followed the Spanglers. George's daughter, Harriet, died two months after he did. Then Harriet's daughter, Annie, died a few days after her mother. So Elizabeth lost her husband, a daughter, and a granddaughter in a little more than two months. One of Daniel's two sons drowned in Kansas. And Benaiah's one and only grandchild died as a toddler. That's what the barn looked like when the foundation bought it in 2008. And you can see what they've done with it. This is what it looked like in 1863. But that barn went through several owners. When they bought it, the first thing they had to do was remove three feet of manure that covered the entire stable, wall to wall, because it was, it was gross, but it was rotting the beams, the support beams, so they had to get it out of there quickly. The bank is on the back. You can't see it in this photo, unfortunately. Down here, that's called their wagon shed. That's where they stored their wagons. The wagon shed, when the time, when the hospital was there, was where the doctors stored the brandy and the whiskey because they used that medicinally. And some doctors, you know, they drank it too. Um, the farm is now open on the weekends in the summer, June, July, and August, probably through Labor Day next year. Friday, Saturdays, and Sundays, you can get a free ticket at the visitor center and you need to ride a bus out. But the same wood is in there that those guys were on. It is still there. You can still see it. You can see where the amputations took place. You can, you can go into the summer kitchen. Sadly, no. You go into the summer kitchen where Armistead and Stowe were. You, Mahler was in the house uh, the officers were in the house. You can't get into the house. But you can, all these fields all around, it was just, once the tents finally arrived, it was just covered. This was an important farm, medically and logistically, and you can just go out there and explore. You can go out where the artillery reserve guys were. You can see all that stuff. Um, last slide. If a sadder task can be found on this earth than that of searching through field hospitals after a great battle, I know not what it is. In those huge Pennsylvania barns covered with mangled bodies of men thick as they could lie, many among them destined never to see the light of another day, presented a spectacle that time cannot efface from the memory of those whom duty called to witness the saddest of mortal sight. 
I do not remember ever feeling more utterly used up in my life than on the last night of Gettysburg. Now, before we wrap this up, I have one more slide because I was talking to somebody up here about, the, somebody asked about Spangler Farms. On the left, the left slide. George, his dad, his brother, his sister, and his dad again. He had two farms in the battlefield. Um, this farm, Susanna Herbst, that's the Herbst farm. That's where Reynolds was shot. It uh, was owned by Susanna Spangler and her husband, John Herbst. It's called Reynolds Woods now. It used to be called Herbst Woods. Henry Spangler. That's where Armistead started to uh, take his charge. And he went from Henry's farm, walked across, died at George's farm. Abraham, dad, dad of all these guys. Spangler Spring is on his, his farm. The visitor center complex today, many of you have been there. Right in here. So Abraham had all, a lot of that. Abraham, that's the Chambersburg Pike. Susanna Her Spangler Herbst, what happened to their farms on day one? Literally, yeah. And I, on this map right here, Abraham's farm was the first one touched by the Confederates. They plowed through there. It's all privately owned now. Uh, Henry or Susanna Spangler's farm was preserved as a part of the battlefield, but yeah, her barn was burned down. So Spanglers owned all that, and they had other distant cousins had land out by the East Cavalry Field as well. But they weren't part of the battle, they were just around that battlefield. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>